really touch upon uh, next six, generation six, six, sequencing six, markets. Sorry. Can you start from the beginning? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, from here. Because we started recording. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay, good morning. Um, today I'll be talking about <laughs> two aspects. One is about uh, markers used in plant phylogenetics. And among them you have uh, I'll briefly touch upon next generation sequencing markers. Is, is there anyone do, using next gen sequencing for phylogeny here in this group here? No, right? But that's the future. So I'll be discussing what is uh, the current trends uh, happening there with some examples of research what's been published. And then I'll, uh, towards the end of the lecture, I'll give some a case study in where I've used uh, molecular phylogenetics. Uh, it covers whatever uh, Praveen has taught so far uh, and with some more examples from my side. So. Uh, for this whole uh, seminar, you've been uh, learning about how to build phylogenetic trees. And we build phylogenetic trees to understand the concept of evolution. What uh, ancestor would have given rise to so many species or genera or families, etc. So for all that, uh, before the concept, been this uh, concept of evolution came after the Darwin's uh, idea of evolution. And from that, uh, the phylogenetic classification became uh, prominent. Like we know that uh, all relation, all organisms are related, interrelated in some way or the other with a common ancestor the, in the distant past. So to do that, mostly uh, people have used only morphology in the previous previous times. But only in uh, 1965, uh, this monumental paper by Zucker, Candle, and Pauling, they thought uh, for phylogenies, for for building this phylogenetic analysis of for, for understanding the evolutionary relationships. Can't we use uh, molecules? So they defined a term called semantides. Semantides are the molecules. Uh, they, they these are different class of biomolecules. They called uh, DNA, RNA, and proteins as semantides. These molecules are capable of changing over a period of time. So they can capture the evolutionary process over a period of time. But if it's a glucose molecule, it's going to be the same structure throughout in all in all of us, right? But the sequence, as a protein as a whole, its sequence is going to change. So there's a lot of there's change being accumulated in these molecules. They call them as semantides. From that period, uh, the idea of molecular phylogenetics came into existence. And uh, interestingly, 1965 is the same uh, year when uh, this Moore's law was given. So the computer industry is also emerging there. And also you have uh, Margaret Dayhoff. She's, she's considered as the father of bioinformatics. She also gave an atlas of uh, proteins, I mean, the protein sequences. So all this came into convergence. So we can say that molecular phylogeny started from 1965. So while using uh, different markers or different uh, biomolecules for uh, ev understanding evolution, uh, we need to understand evolution at different levels, especially at the higher levels, at the family level. And at the lower level, that means at the species level or below the species level, intraspecific variation, etc. So different kinds of molecules should be used. For higher level, generally the protein sequences or protein coding genes are used, uh, like uh, any, any gene which is coding for a protein. And for lower level, uh, we use mostly non-coding regions, like what uh, Praveen just mentioned. They are uh, markers which are under non-selection, non I mean, which are not under selection, neutral markers, especially the introns and intergenic regions. So uh, the uh, any cell has multiple genomes. It has a nuclear genome and the other mitochondrial and the plastid genome, right? So the nuclear genome contains the maximum amount of information, uh, and it, it can be widely used. And most of the phylogenetics have used phylogenetics uh, analysis have used nuclear regions. So the prop, but each of these markers, nuclear as well as plastid, they both have uh, positives and negatives, which we will go in detail. But uh, nuclear regions have this paralogs. Just now, Praveen discussed what's a paralog, right? A gene duplication would have happened. And when you're uh, capturing that paralog to build a phylogeny, it will screw up your phylogeny. And also this uh, concerted evolution. After this gene has been duplicated, it's, it, is it is evolving in a different fashion, like, uh, like how NUMS, they entered into the nuclear genome and they are evolving at a different rate. So these are the pitfalls uh, we come across. Plastids, uh, especially when it comes to plants, since this talk is about plants, uh, plastids, the big advantage is they are uh, single copies and they are maternally, uniparently inherited. So hybridizations won't affect it. And, uh, uh, and it can be used in, at different levels, even family level, species level, multiple levels, it can be used. So have you any, any plant person, have you used this, come across this marker, internal transcribed spacer? 
so most of the plant phylogenetists or the fungal phylogenetists also would understand this. So this is nothing but the internal transcribed spacer. So this is the ribosomal DNA which is present in multiple tandem repeats in the genome. So that obviously it makes it as a high copy gene. It's like several copies, maybe around a million copies might be there in the genome because it's the most important gene, the ribosomal genes. So in between these coding regions, the 5.8s and the 16.s, there are some uh, internal transcribed spacer regions. That means they are, they are transcribed, but they are not any, uh, doing any function. So this region is under uh, not any selection. So this can serve as a very good marker. So this marker uh, called ITS, internal transcribed spacer, published in 1990. It was published for a fungal sequences. It is based on the fungal sequences. So because these regions are coding regions, it, it was easy to synthesize the uh, primers here. So 26S has a very specific, it's a functional gene, right? So you can build, you can keep the primers in these regions, in these flanking regions, and across organisms. So this marker, ITS 5 and 4, can work from fungi to plants. This primer can work across all the uh, levels, like plants and fungi. I don't know, it doesn't work with uh, animals, or I'm not aware of that. But this is, these markers are used for? Spiders, they've used ITS. Yeah, uh, is, is the same marker, ITS, 4 and 5? Yeah, yeah, 4 and this is the, from the same paper, I think. This paper has uh, so far uh, 35,000 publications, so it's a very monumental paper because they have published a very important marker. So these are, this is nothing but they, they are universal primers and the size of the product is around 700 base pairs. So the Sanger sequencing, one round of uh, sequencing also yields about 700 base pairs. So if you're doing one forward sequence and one reverse sequence, you would complete one ITS. So it's very convenient and it, it has enough amount of variation so you can even differentiate species and also sometimes interspecific, below the species, uh, species level also you can differentiate that. Uh, and it, other advantage is that it can also detect the hybridizations because if uh, there are hybrid species is formed, two forms of the ITS would be there because uh, this genome is inherited from two parents and one of the ITS form would also still exist in the parent, but over a period of time, it gets converted into one, one form. But until that, you, you, if, if there is a recent uh, hybridization event, you can identify using these kind of nuclear markers. I think uh, Kunal is not here, right? He, he was also looking for hybridizations in uh, Langus. I think he used some uh, nuclear markers. So similar to that, there's an exter external transcribed spacer, similar. So external transcribed spacer is just the region above the 18S. So it is in between two, uh, what do you call like operons, like two stretches of these uh, uh, ribosomal RNA genes. And uh, upstream of that, you have this uh, transcription initiation site, which will also have a conserved sequence. So you can set your primer here, and then you can uh, sequence the region between this transcription initiation site and the 18S RRNA. So these are also present in multiple copies, easy to amplify. But the problem with this uh, ETS is that this region is highly variable. It's not like this uh, 18S or 26S uh, sequences. So the primers you have to synthesize or sequence for a, uh, you have to design your new primers for each plant group or animal group you're working with. So a com in comparison with ITS, it has more parsimony informative characters. You can see here uh, it's 136 uh, parsimony informative characters for a very short, of around in just 500 uh, base pair region, it is very highly informative. It, it has accumulated a lot of spontaneous mutations within this region. So it's one of the very good markers. Uh, problem is there's no universal uh, primer for that. Then this one is uh, NCPGS, uh, like Praveen just uh, talked about uh, single copy genes, right? So this is a single copy gene. Uh, it's a nuclear marker. So here, uh, people started using the introns in these single copy genes. So one of them is uh, NCPGS. So these are the different uh, primers, universal primers, almost universal. It can work across a different uh, range of plants, different families. So it has been used in uh, several plant groups. And likewise, other introns have been uh, got from these Pepsis, uh, polyenol pyruvate carboxylase, one of the important uh, proteins in the uh, photosynthesis pathway. So some introns in that gene has also been used. Uh, and also these other uh, ADH, alcohol dehydrogenase genes. So these intronic regions are not under any selection pressure. These are neutral markers from the genome. So somebody asked about neutral markers in the genome. Right? These are all 
neutral markers from the uh, nuclear genome. So likewise, these match box are nothing but uh, transcription factors which determine how the flower shape is formed. So some uh, intronic regions of these match box uh, family of transcription factors are, have also been used. So these are some, some of the examples. So I'll rush because we don't have time. So we'll, uh, the next is uh, microsat -like markers. So have, has, has anyone worked with microsat markers? In the, in the population level, it's widely used, right? Microsats are nothing but uh, repeats, re uh, repeats which are repeating multiple times. And they, they should be at a stretch of one to nine nucleotides. That's the that's definition of a microsatellite. So here it's a microsatellite of GATA. It is repeating uh, eight times in one uh, species and, in, and it's repeating nine times in one species. So this, is, this can serve as very good uh, markers even in uh, even in forensic sciences. This is the microsat markers I used to distinguish even individuals, among individuals. No two individuals will have the number of these repeats same. Because of the DNA polymerase is when it is trying to make a copy, and since it's the same copy, it slips and makes more copies most, most often. So that's why the number of uh, microsats within a region is variable. So by measuring the length of these microsats, you can uh, even distinguish between individuals also. So more because of that, these are widely used in population genetics to identify how much of the genome variation is there in a population. But phylogenetics have also take, uh, taken advantage of this. Since this is a very conserved region, right? you can just use this as a primer, PCR primer, and you can sequence or you can amplify this region adjacent to the ISSR, or simple sequence repeats or the microsat regions. So if you can sequence the region between two different microsats, so that can serve as a marker. So though they are not microsats, they are non-coding regions and not under a pressure. They are neutral genes again. So they can also be used as markers here. So this is an example, uh, a paper which is talking about development of uh, such markers. So the problem is these markers have to be developed for that particular group. If you're studying uh, one family or one genus, so you have to uh, try different microsat primers and uh, see if the same band is being amplified across the uh, samples which are collected from the same genus and then uh, usually the length of these bands were used for uh, population genetics but now they started to sequence the region adjacent to the microsat region and based on that they built phylogenies like using it as a neutral marker and it was highly efficient when compared to uh, there's a comparison between uh, the generally used markers also so likewise, these transposable elements also can be used as markers, but mostly they are used in population genetics and not much has been used in the phylogeny. So now we are in the genomic era. So all these have been changed nowadays. Any, any journal, even with an impact factor of 1.5 or above, started publishing phylogenies with a genomic data set, I mean, uh, sequencing using the next generation sequencing method. So uh, can anyone guess which year the next gen sequencing came into existence or which year it became popular? Or at least which year the genome, human genome was published? 2003, 2003, right? And what's the cost of the human genome project? It was around $3 billion. We have 3 billion base pairs in our body and $3 billion, so it's like $1 uh, dollar for a base pack. So that much was the cost. But nowadays, uh, human genome can be sequenced in just uh, maybe 1,000 US dollars, or, or even less, maybe 500 US dollars also. So that such is the power of the next-gen sequencing uh, technology. And recently, you might have come across in the news that uh, in UK, they have suggested all the newborn babies should be, genome should be sequenced. So that, that much uh, convenient it has become nowadays. So this technology was uh, appeared in the horizon around 2003. So we are already 14 years away from the in initiation of this next-gen sequencing technology. So this is, has become the mainstream nowadays. The problem with this is the, it involves, uh, for non-model systems like whatever uh, biological diversity which we are studying, we need to have a, we don't, we, if we don't have a reference sequence, humans we have a reference sequence, but for non-model systems, assembly would be difficult. So in such cases, we do a de novo assembly. So such assemblies would not be that much uh, accurate and also expensive and time consuming. But nowadays, all of uh, these gaps have been almost uh, bridged because of the 
high computational power we have, like big data analysis, uh, high computing power and all. So these are the platforms you might have heard about for next-gen sequencing, 454, Roche 454 was there in 2007, this was uh, very popular, but nowadays I, I, sc I scored it because it's, they've stopped production of this, this model. So what is uh, the reigning technology is the Illumina, PacBio and Oxford Nanopo. These are the three technologies which are more popular nowadays. May, probably they will become the future. But among them, Illumina is the most powerful one. So it, uh, this next-gen sequencing also uh, does the same sequencing in a massively parallel way. That means uh, instead of sequencing one gene at a time, we are going to do uh, multiple genes, break down the genome into a small, small fragments and add some adapters and these adapters will go and bind to a glass slide here and you can synthesize and the size of these fragments will be around uh, maybe 300 or 400 base pairs and they bind to the glass slide which has a complementary region to the adapter and once the other strand is synthesized and this gets amplified multiple times by this bridge amplification so there is a one adapt one primer here which can bind to another primer on the glass plate and they can do a PCR reaction and it can do a clonal amplification. So it, for one sequence, it can be represented as one clone in a, in a slide. And uh, while uh, adding a nucleotide to the complementary strand, uh, there is a chemistry that uh, when, a, when a complementary nucleotide is added, one particular light is emitted. And those light spots, fluoresce, these are fluorescent spots, and these high density fluorescent spots can be picked up. So whenever a new nucleotide is being added, one light is emitted and a powerful camera is going to capture all these things, these light signals, and it's going to say in one spot how many lights were being processed. And you know how many, and you can easily convert, it, convert them into the number of nucleotides. I mean, how many nucleotides were being uh, read in one region. And uh, there's something called a pad and sequencing, right? Uh, pad and is, when you're, when you're doing this kind of uh, massively parallel sequencing, you're, you're fragmenting your DNA into very small pieces and putting it in the, hybridizing it on a glass slide. But you're trying to read it, if you're reading it from, from one side, the, the capacity of Illumina, what read it can read, Illumina uh, sequencing read, 100 base pairs. It's only 100 base pairs. So if you're reading only 100 base pairs, it won't be enough. So they have just a little bit advancement of that. So they have, uh, by this bridge amplification, this strand is sequence, I mean, it's uh, hybridized to us another, I mean, it is bent like this and it is amplified. So this strand, after cleaving here, it becomes like this. So you can read this from the other end also, the same one. So for one DNA fragment, you get two reads from the opposite direction. They may not meet uh, in, the, in the middle region, there might be some gap, but still you have more information rather than reading 100 sequence, 100 base pairs, you can read another 100 base pairs. And all this can be computationally joined together to form these kind of contexts. So e each of these small fragments can represent the entire genome. And how many times these small fragments are representing one genome is called the coverage. If, uh, if 100 fragments are covering for one small region in the genome, it's called 100x. So this is just the basics of uh, next-gen sequencing. So based on next-gen sequencing, a lot of papers have started coming since the 10, uh, last 10 years also. So this paper was in uh, 2011 when they have sequenced a non-model plant, this Asclepias, uh, the milkweed. So I work on milkweed, so I just uh, was particularly interested in this paper. In 2011 itself, 10 years back itself, they have tried a non, the assembly everything was done de novo. And from that they could assemble that uh, a draft genome, not a complete genome, almost 50 to 80% complete genome. From that they got so much information, like they got the entire chloroplast, because they got the entire total uh, DNA from the plant and then they, it did the next gen sequencing so they were they were able to obtain the chloroplast genome also from this next gen sequencing run the partial mitochondrial genome was also obtained and several other uh, and and all these genes were uh, similar to the uh, unigene data is the data where the, all the mrna transcript sequences are uh, posted in the database right so whatever uh, sequences they got from this plant was similar, 88% 80, similar to Catharanthus roseus, which is also belonging to the same family. So this is kind of a data evaluation what they have done after this next gen sequencing. So the main thing what they did, uh, I want to focus on this was, they also synthesized these uh, microsat uh, markers. So, so they, they used, uh, since you have the entire genome in front of you, now you can uh, screen for the microsat regions. 
So using these uh, specific programs which can scan the genome and look for microsat regions, you can identify the microsat regions and then you can, you can also, you know the sequences of the regions adjacent to the microsat regions. And based on those, you can design primers and you can use them as population genetics markers, pop gen markers, because the number of microsats is going to vary among individuals. Right? So by using this method, they have also done this. So this is a routine procedure now, uh, even for pop gen marker developed population genetics, they're using this methodology only nowadays. Next is uh, this next generation sequencing method also uses something called the RAD sequencing. This is where the application of phylogenetics comes here. Uh, when, when you want to sequence the whole genome for one particular organism, it's not required in most cases, right? Uh, we are not interested for, in analyzing the entire genome of an uh, unknown organism. What we uh, taxonomists or uh, molecular phylogenetists want to know that under 10 different uh, organisms, what is the sequence of the same gene under 10 different organisms? So in, we need not sequence the entire organism's genome. We, just, we are just only interested in the phylogeny. So here, instead of taking the entire genome, we want to do a reduced representation of the genome. So for that, uh, there are several methods. One of them is rat sequencing, uh, targeted amplicon sequencing. Targeted amplicon is just like using some uh, microarrays to capture a portion of the genome, not the entire genome, and only sequencing those, whatever we require. So this is uh, like, like an array system, the, the genome is fragmented and all the complementary strands uh, are placed in a microarray. And only the car, uh, and they are allowed to hybridize with the sequences which you want to capture. And after you capture it, you release it and sequence it. So only a part, part of the genome is uh, I mean, sequenced rather than the whole genome. So by this, we can add more and more samples rather than uh, taking the in-depth whole genome. So for phylogenies, we need to know only the SNPs and the neutral regions, right? Non, non, uh, 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 regions which are under, not which are under uh, not under selections. So these are the two methods. So based on that, uh, several papers have also come out. Apart from that, there's another uh, method also called mixed sequencing, which I'll uh, talk about later. So this is uh, the rad sequencing. Is using a uh, uh, the use of restriction enzymes. It is some somewhat similar to AFLP or RAPD, where you use a restriction enzyme to cut it. Instead of see, I mean studying the uh, length of the uh, cut fragments, we are going to sequence the regions between that. So using this, uh, after cutting it, we just add these two adapters and then uh, do the normal uh, rat sequencing, I mean uh, next gen Illumina sequencing, and we get only the regions adjacent to these uh, restriction end endonuclease sites. Only you're going to put an adapter here so that the Illumina run will read some, some sequences across this region, right? Only maybe 100 base pairs is enough. And we are going to compile it with along different uh, species which you're going to use. Instead of using one uh, one individual or one species, you're going to use pool 96 species because it's in a 96 well plate. How we can separate it is using these kind of barcodes. So you can use a specific uh, barcode in each of these primers which you're going to amplify. Uh, for one species, you can use one particular barcode. And finally, after the sequencing, based on this barcode, you can pull out all the samples and say this is a, these are all coming from one species. So after that, there is a you can stack all of these, and that that's uh, the, the, those are called stacks, rat sequencing stacks. They are nothing but sequences next to a restriction endonuclease site, and the same kind of rest, uh, can be compared across all the species. In uh, if it's a related species, it will also have a genome which has a restriction endonuclease site at a similar position in a homologous position, and from there, you're going to read the sequence adjacent to that. So based on that, you can build phylogenies. So this is the most prevalent technology used for both phylogeny and as well as uh, population genetics also, because we are looking for these SNPs. So as I mentioned, you can uh, multiplex these samples. In one run itself, you can get 96 species uh, sequenced, and that too, so much of information can be gained. And, uh, Praveen mentioned, right, like at least you can use, uh, he told, the, what's the number of genes to use? He, I remember he mentioned around six to eight genes he mentioned, right? 10 to 20. 10 to 20, 10 to 20. But using RAD-seq, you can get even more than that, maybe thousands of genes you can do. So the more data you have, the more robust is your phylogeny. There's no ambiguity, everything is clear. So based on that, uh, these are some of the phylogenies uh, published. 
So here they use 20 specimens uh, of a uh, oak species from North America. This was published in 2017, I think. So they have why, ap applied this technology to build this kind of phylogenetic tree. And it, was, it is well resolved. It, it, could, it gives good bootstrap support. There's no ambiguity. There's no polytomies and all, because more data is used here. So this is a recent paper, which is uh, it's not yet published. Uh, this is about uh, another rat seek phylogeny, where they used uh, 190 accessions using rat seek. So imagine what kind of thing can be done. So if you're trying to do 190 uh, specimens with 10 genes, like how many, how much of work is going to be there and how much of time also is going to take. So all that can be uh, accelerated using this next gen sequencing method. And maybe the cost will be the same, but the amount of data you get here is more. So the, here they, they used, uh, uh, I mean, how, this, this, you can also talk about how many uh, taxa should be sampled, Praveen told how many taxa should be sampled. Right? The genus has uh, 300 species. They have, uh, they've collected at least 167 uh, species, which is more than around 56% of the diversity of the genus itself. The previous works have also tried to do that, like this paper, which, which they've used like four or five genes using Sanger sequencing. They have done probably, they have done only 100 species. So they, they are able to sample more, get more genes, get well-resolved phylogenies. And a beauty of this paper is that they have used herbarium specimens. So imagine if you're having 100 and, uh, um, 300 uh, species in a genus, how can you sample? And these, they are spread in Africa, India, and so, uh, Southeast Asia, everywhere. So one person cannot go and collect everything, right? So it's easier to collect from the herbarium specimens. Herbarium specimens uh, indicate that the, the DNA will also be degraded by nature, and also you can connect more also. So this paper proves that even with very little amount of DNA, like taking a half leaf or very little portion from the herbarium specimen, you can build a well-resolved phylogeny like this. And another thing is, uh, since you're using a same marker system, like if you're using a same restriction endonuclease uh, for the rat sequence, uh, I mean, to cut the genome initially, to create the fragments, this can be used, uh, this, this data can be replicated. Say, say, for example, they have done 167 species. Now I have 30 species from India. I can do the same methodology and I can plug in this data to this data also. So this kind of feature is also there with RADSEQ. If you're using the same kind of uh, 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 restriction endonuclease to create the libraries, you can, uh, reproducibility is also there. Additional, in, since uh, earlier times, right, if, uh, this kind of repro reproducibility will not be there. If you're using microsat markers and all, it's very difficult. But since you're using this RADSEQ, you can add more data to it also. So now coming to uh, the other genomes, which is mitochondrial, uh, mitochondrial and plastid DNA. So in the previous slide, I uh, remember Praveen mentioned uh, how much times uh, mitochondria evolves faster than the nuclear genome? Eight. Eight times. But here you can see it's uh, 100 times slower than, in, in plants, they, they, uh, mitochondrial DNA is 100 times slower than the nuclear DNA. Uh, oh, it's 100 times slower than the animal mitochondrial DNA. But when you, when you compare with the nuclear DNA within the animals, within the plants also, its evolution is very, very slow. And uh, chloroplast DNA is a widely used marker for plants. Uh, it's four times slower than the chloroplast DNA itself. So with, it clearly shows that mitochondrial DNA is not a very good marker for uh, animal uh, plant phylogeny. The, the most used uh, mitochondrial marker is the COX-1 gene, right? So you, you have 10% variation between two sequences, then you can say they are two different species. So that's why they have used this, that as a barcode. Uh, that's why mitochondrial DNA was initially used in the like maybe 15 years back, but nowadays uh, people don't use it because of these reasons. Chloroplast, chloroplast region, uh, DNA is widely used for plant uh, phylogeny. If somebody is working with the plant uh, molecular phylogenetics, you might have definitely used these markers. Single copy number with the no parology. It's, it, it doesn't have two copies, so there's no paralogous genes. Uh, inherited from a single parent, there's no hybridization. And there are lots of copies in the cell, so easy to amplify. No, the lots of chloroplasts, and e even within the chloroplasts, there are lots of copies of these uh, plasmid like uh, genomes there. And this is the ones widely used in plant phylogenetics. So this is the, I'll just skip this. So RBCL is the widely used 
uh, marker for plant phylogeny. So this is a coding gene. This is the ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. You remember, it's the, it's the first uh, protein in the uh, light harvesting reaction in, in uh, photosynthesis. So this is a very uh, important protein, and this sequence has been used for building a lot of phylogenies. So even this uh, APG system is kind of a phylogenetic system of uh, classification of plants. Even they have used, uh, apart from the 18S ribosomal RNA gene, they've also used RBCL and ATPB. So these two are coding regions. So obviously these can be used for only the um, uh, higher levels, family level uh, or genus level. If you go to the species level, RBCL will be under selection, somewhat of a selection. So there will be there won't be any variation, that much of variation. MATK is also one of the coding genes. So it's it's also widely used. Um, it's is one of the important markers used in plant uh, phylogeny. It, it can be considered as a barcode also like how the COX-1 is there. Apart from that, you have this TRN, TL, and uh, TRN, L, LF, et cetera. These are, this is a region in the chloroplast which is containing uh, the intergenic regions between the, this is the gene coding for the TRNA T, the TRNA, uh, uh, which is uh, encoding for the uh, uh, TRNA T, and this is the uh, region between those two genes. It's called the intergenic and intronic uh, sequences. So if you're interested, you can go through this paper. They have dis discovered, discussed about several non-coding regions in the chloroplast and what combination should be used for getting uh, more phylogenetic or uh, parsimoniously informative characters. You, you studied about parsimony informative characters, right, in your practicals also. So uh, which combinations could be used? And so based on this paper, you can choose if you're, if you're going to set out to uh, do a new project on plant phylogeny, you can uh, read through these papers and uh, see which marker would be suitable for you. Apart from that, you should try it out in your system. Something which has been worked out in one family, it might not be working with other family, but there are universal primers for these. You can get these primers easily and uh, you can easily amplify. The big advantage of chloroplast markers is that um, there's a single copy and uh, after PCR, you will get a single band. It won't be uh, not multiple bands also because these primers are very specific to the chloroplast DNA. Uh, when you're using the nuclear ITS, you might come across contamination with the fungal, the fungal DNA. Because uh, plants contain several endophytic fungi, right? So when you're extracting the uh, DNA from the plants, you also end up extracting the fungal DNA. So when you're doing a, when you're, uh, when you're doing a PCR amplification with ITS region, you might get multiple bands. So that can be avoided when you're using a chloroplast marker, which only, only can come from the plants. So these are rather current papers. So nowadays, chloroplast genomes can also be used. So uh, the tobacco chloroplast I mentioned, it is 150,000 base pairs, 150 KB region. So nowadays, in the genomic era, using next-gen sequencing, we are able to sequence the entire chloroplast rather than using only portions of the chloroplast. In this paper, which is published recently, 2021, they have used 22 geranium species. They have used the entire chloroplast genome. And also, they have used a nuclear uh, uh, genomic DNA also. So this, they use some technology called a mul multiplexed uh, intersimple sequence uh, repeat. So this is nothing but how I mentioned in the previous uh, paper, the region adjacent to the uh, simple sequence repeat, so using these uh, simple sequence repeats as the primers, you can amplify the regions adjacent to that. Uh, one paper I've talked about in the Anonesi I mentioned in the previous slides, right? They have sequenced that. So the same technology they have used here, so they are using this uh, regions adjacent to the simple sequence repeats using next-gen sequencing. And they have compared the phylogeny between the nuclear data set and the chloroplast data set. And there are some, uh, usually this uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA will have some in incongruencies, right? So they observe such incongruencies also. But however, since they use more uh, genomic information, they were able to get well-resolved phylogenies compared to the other, uh, other phylogenies which was built using multiple markers. So this is a well-known group. They have, uh, although phylogenetic analysis have been conducted in conventional methods, uh, still there was some problem in the resolution of the taxa. So they, they have sorted out using the genome level data. So I'll briefly touch upon uh, barcoding. So DNA barcoding is the idea of using uh, DNA barcodes to identify a species. 
instead of using a morphological identification, or it can be useful for uh, forensic analysis or quarantine where somebody brings an unknown plant and, and you don't know what plant it is. When you, when you have it barcoded, you can easily identify it and prove it that's the same plant, right? That's, uh, so for that, animal barcoding people used COX-1 genes, uh, cytochrome oxidase 1. For plants, what is a barcoding marker? So these are the probable candidates, MATK, which I discussed. These are the probable candidates. Uh, consortium of Barcoding of Life is a group of scientists working on barcoding of life, and they have come across this one, come, up, come out with this, these markers. The problem is, uh, for plants, we don't have a universal marker. So this is the paper uh, which talked about the uh, three uh, genera Berberis, Ficus, and Gossypium. So in that, they have, they have tried to use e PSBA, TRNH. These three, are, these, uh, three indicated here are the uh, green ones, are the chloroplast markers. ITS is a nuclear marker. So they, try, they wanted to find out which is the most efficient one. So some of the combinations like PSBH and uh, ITS would work for one, like they take 10 species of ficus and they, want, they know what species are there and they want to see whether the barcodes can identify them as separate branches in the phylogeny. Most of the cases it worked, but for Berberis it didn't work. Even a combination of all of these it didn't work. So that's why uh, a universal barcode for plants is not there. So you have to test it for each of the systems. So since this barcode could not separate uh, at least 20 different species of Berberis, they resorted to some other uh, AFLP or other methods. So these are the problems with barcodes. As I mentioned, ITS has uh, multiple copies. So you can't use ITS as a, a clear-cut barcode, because uh, paralogs would be there. And in PSBA, TR, and H, there, there might be a lot of gaps, so alignment uh, would be difficult. And these gaps, you don't know whether they are sequencing errors or actually there are gaps or not. So such ambiguities are always present. So people are still looking for the DNA barcode. But usually whatever data we generate serves as a barcode. Like if you're working on any plant group, you put it in the gene bank, it automatically becomes a barcode. So it's your duty to authenticate that specimen with a herbarium specimen or some museum specimen. So I think I have less time, so I'll just rush through the next part of the slide. So here I want to discuss uh, cryptic speciation in, um, in a group of orchids called uh, uh, Spiranthus. So I'll skip all these things. You have studied what is a species. Species is the fundamental unit of evolution. So uh, for taxonomists, we have to identify what is a species. So for that, several uh, methods are being used. So this is about speciation. Uh, several um, species concepts are there, morphological species concepts, uh, biological species concept, ecological species concept, and phylogenetic species concept. This is based on whatever data we generate from phylogenetic trees. So in traditional taxonomy, this is a rank-based taxonomy since the uh, time of Linnaeus from 1750. We have at least uh, eight different uh, ranks like uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, uh, family, genus. So this is uh, our aim of identifying a species is to put it in a taxonomical order like this. But uh, in the molecular phylogeny, or molecular phylogeny, whatever we um, create, does it fit under any of these uh, category? No, because uh, in a in a in a rank based system, you have these eight fixed ranks. But when you are doing a phylogeny, there must be uh, lineages which might deviate, or several clades might be separating. And within those clades, there'll be subclades, and within those subclades, so they, those won't fit those eight categories. What is given by the rank based system? That is an older system. But nowadays, uh, modern taxonomists are adopting to a cladistic based method. Did Pravin talk about phylocode? Yeah, so that's the phylocode uh, system which was proposed by Kevin De Quiro and uh, Jacques Gauthier from the Harvard University in 1998. So to describe a species, uh, you need not have the same fixed ranks. It can be called as clade 1, clade 2, clade 3, and each of these clades can be given a different, uh, taxonom a different uh, taxonomical name. So this kind of taxonomy will be the future. So uh, many of the uh, musea would try to, or musea and herbaria would want to move to this kind of uh, taxonomy, but it would change a disruption in this system. So that's a big uh, problem there. But we are moving towards a system. If you've gone through the APG system, the current APG system, many of these uh, things are just called clades instead of calling a family or 
uh, order or something, they just call clade, this clade, under this clade, this genera is there like that. So this is the use of, one of the uses of uh, phylogenetics, molecular phylogenetics. So these things I'll step. So our basis of uh, genus or species classification is based on the concept of a monophyly, Praveen would have talked about it, right? So this polyphyly and paraphyly, even if you observe, it must be due to some artifacts or some uh, wrong morphological assignment of the species. So you, whenever you find this kind of paraphyly and polyphyly, you have to go back and revisit your taxonomy. So I'm skipping uh, many of these because of lack of time. But you understand the concept of monophyly and how it can determine a genus or a species. So this slide is uh, about a polyphyly and I just wanted to emphasize on this is my work on uh, the genus called Serapegia. Uh, Praveen was uh, just uh, some time before he was mentioning how many species to sample, right? So I was working on the species uh, Indian Serapegia. So when I was doing my PhD, I collected only from uh, Maharashtra or the Western Ghats region. So when I built the phylogeny, I, this is the samples uh, in the top portion is my samples. Uh, when I wanted, if I built a phylogeny uh, only with my samples, I would have just given the interrelationships between the uh, Indian Serapegia, whatever I collected. But luckily, just uh, while I was doing my PhD, I got uh, the, uh, 2007, there was another paper published, which was which has done a phylogeny of uh, the Serapegia in the Africa. The Africa has the most diversity. So, uh, like somebody asked, how, why should, how should we, why, should we add all this uh, info, available uh, information? Yes, you should. Otherwise, you won't get the real picture. So, I, uh, I collected all the data from the, what is available in the database, data set, and I added my, uh, my, my, my specimens also. So, only then I found that the Indian uh, species are one single radiation uh, from probably some one dispersal event was there, and all of the Indian species were coming in one clade. Otherwise, I would have been thinking that, I mean, I wouldn't have a relative phylogeny. And most important thing is that uh, the Indian species, uh, there's another uh, genus called the Brachistelma, which is having an open, open flower type. If this uh, open flower type generally consider, is considered as a different genus. And uh, the, the Brachistelma was also published from Africa, which was uh, from the other paper. So I, when I combine all, I mean, my idea was to see what's the relationship between Serapegia and Brachistelma. If I'm working on Serapegia, I just put the Serapegia in my phylogeny. I wouldn't have, uh, the, what result I obtained was Brachistelma, the Indian Brachistelma is, is a different lineage than the African Brachistelma. They are coming as two different lineages. Based on morphology, they have been classified as Brachistelma. But uh, the phylogeny indicates that the Indian open flowered flowers have originated from the Indian stock of Serapegia, which had a uh, and Serapegia like ancestors. So, so that's the importance of uh, taxon sampling. If I had left out Brachistelma here, so people would still think at that period when I published it, Brachistelma is still monophyletic. But my data showed that Brachistelma is not monophyletic. The name only Brachistelma is coming in two places. It looks polyphyletic. But now we understand the open type flowers have evolved multiple times in multiple geographic locations. So this is... Uh, just have, in 10 minutes I can finish like this is the work from Praveen's lab. 12, uh, 12.30 can I finish Praveen? Okay. So I had so much slides so I'm skipping many of them. So this is a little bit I'm talking about the cryptic uh, species. This slides I think Praveen just now also talked. So this is the Hanuman langur or the Indian grey langur. So it's distributed uh, across India, I mean all over India from uh, and also in Sri Lanka. So they, are, they were being considered as one species, uh, put under Semnopithecus entellus as only one species. And this is the Nilgiri langur, put under Trachypithecus, another, another genus. And this is a related uh, langur, uh, purple faced langur from Sri Lanka. So this, this was also uh, Trachypithecus. So these are the other Trachypithecus species from uh, Southeast Asia. So the phylogeny, the morphological based phylogeny said, said that Semnopithecus and Trachypithecus are two different genera and Hanuman langur is a monotypic genus with only one species, I mean with only Semnopithecus entellus only. So this is the phylogeny uh, based on the mitochondrial DNA, what uh, Praveen, uh, it's Praveen's work in 2010. You can see uh, all these um, 
when you're using a mitochondrial DNA, the morphology says that uh, Neil, uh, these, these Semnopithecus is uh, Hanuman Langur and Nilgiri Langur is uh, Trachypithecus. But when you do a mitochondrial DNA, these things come, come together as a monophyletic clade. These th the, all these comes as a monophyletic clade. Now we, ha we have to rethink our morphological classification, whether this is really a, a Semnopithecus or Trachypithecus. So if this clade has one common ancestor, then this should be called as Semnopithecus. So Semnopithecus also has uh, multiple lineages as uh, Praveen said, uh, North Indian lineage is different and the South Indian lineage is different and even the Sri Lankan lineage is totally different. So they can be considered as three different species. Are they three different species now, Praveen? You're, yeah, yeah, they are. They are. They are. Uh, they, have, they have published it as three different species. This is the initial work what he has done. So this is the concept of cryptic species. Uh, one species giving rise to uh, multiple species, and they diverge in multiple axes, not only in morphological axis. They can diverge in uh, reproductive traits. Uh, they can uh, diverge in molecular divergence, uh, morphological divergence, behavioral divergence is also one of them, and ecological divergence. And they and if they are the diverge in all of these scales, they can be considered as true species. But what if they are not uh, diverged or recently diverging species? They they are not they diverge in multiple axes. You you might consider the morphology is not uh, diversified, but the phylogeny is diversified. Uh, we could we would uh, end up in calling them as different species, like like the uh, uh, Semnopithecus example we saw. So. Likewise, you have examples of uh, other uh, cryptic species which have been recently discovered using uh, molecular data. Uh, another work from Praveen's lab by uh, Deepak, he worked on this uh, Sitana ponticeriana. This is a species published in 18, uh, 1829, I think, the Cuvier, the, the great zoologist, he published this a Sitana ponticeriana. So until Deepak, many people have uh, probably 150 years, they, it was still one species uh, present in, uh, uh, it's a widespread species in Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, and parts of Pakistan. So it's a widespread species. People consider it as, as only one species. And since they have not done a phylogeny, uh, they could not differentiate, uh, they could not do a final scale sc sampling. They couldn't differentiate how many species would have been there. But there are some morphological differences, but it was not documented. So now, uh, uh, Deepak's work proved that there are several species, at least uh, he has published at eight different species, and among that lineage, he also published a different genus also called uh, Sarda, based on some morphological differences. So after observing the diversity in the phylogenetic scale, he has gone into the details of the morphology, and he has uh, easily found out they are different species. Only problem is their uh, differences were not uh, much, or they were not studied in detail. So using phylogeny also, you can easily find out new species. So likewise, another work from Praveen's lab uh, on this uh, centipedes. Initially, there were only three uh, genera of centipedes. Janvi's work was about, I think he might have, she might have discussed about this also. So initially, it was thought only three uh, species were there. But using phylogeny, she found that at least uh, nine different putative species are there. Each one is coming out as a separate clade, well-supported clade. And later she worked out uh, to, on the morphological aspects uh, using morphometry and all. She could identify them as different species. So this is um, these are different examples what I have given called uh, the identification of species based on different characters apart from morphology is called integrative taxonomy. You, you don't only use morphology. And integrative means you use uh, several things. Uh, these things I'll skip. You can use uh, ecological variation, you can use a behavioral uh, variation also, you can use acoustic variation also, and also, uh, and also, of course, molecular data. So these gene tree species trees and all I'll uh, skip because of lack of time, I'll just go to this group which I've been studying, uh, phylogeny of uh, Asian spiranthus. So this is a land orchid, which is a tiny orchid, which is called lady stresses, which is grown in, uh, this is a species called Spiranthus hongkongensis, which was uh, native to Hong Kong. And I'll, I'll introduce other species also. This is a Spiranthus nivea. This is a endemic species to Taiwan. And this is the newly described Spiranthus sunnyi from uh, China. 
uh, Guangzhou province in China. See, morphologically, they're very much similar, white flowered plants, and they're very tiny plants again. They're, they're not big showy flowers. Um, they were and another white colored species was found in uh, India, uh, in Kurg region. You know, I've collected it from Kurg and several places, Himachal Pradesh. This is from Assam, and this is from Manipur. So this white colored species I collected from different parts of India. So according to the Indian uh, taxonomy, this was called uh, Spiranthus sinensis. And while I collected, I thought it's uh, sinensis. An Indian archaeologist considered this as Spiranthus sinensis. Uh, these are all several collections. This is from Manipur, and uh, there's another uh, paper from a uh, report from Nepal. So they also published a morphologically similar uh, Spiranthus called, and they named it as Spiranthus spiralis. So Spiranthus spiralis. Uh, is a uh, European species, I'll come to that later. They, they thought this is that European species, like how the Indian species they thought as Indian, sinensis. So these are all related, the white colored flowers, morphologically they're similar. And then this is a Chinese spiranthus, or spiranthus sinensis. This is the only pink flowered spiranthus. This is a widespread species. It is found from uh, India to China, and also Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. It's a very big distribution. And this, uh, this is from uh, Uttarakhand, many, many species are collected. So this is what the Australians call it as Spiranthus australis. They consider it as a different species. It's a pink colored flower. Uh, we don't know really they are truly different species or not until we did a phylogeny. So this is the Spiranthus spiralis. This is about, I'm talking about Spiranthus of Europe and America. In Europe, there are two species, Spiranthus uh, spiralis, white colored flowered one, and uh, Another one is um, Estivalis, which is also white colored one. These two are the European ones. The rest of them are Asian ones. The genus is about 50 species. The rest of the species are all in North America. They are well studied. In, they are native to North America because the maximum diversity is in North America. So these are all the North American uh, uh, ones. I'll skip it. So these are all the North American ones. So before I started my work, uh, there was a published work, uh, Deo et al. in uh, 2014. They have done a well-resolved phylogeny of the North American species. So they have done their part. And here they have used, you might not see it, they have mentioned uh, Eurasian species. All the species which I showed, they put, their sampling was too less. It was called the Eurasian species. So uh, we did a sampling of all the Asian uh, spiranthus. Uh, mainly through herbarium specimens, field visits. It's a difficult thing because we have to collect from all over India, China, Korea, all these places, and some from Australia, Japan. So we wrote to the people who are working there to collect some specimens. It's a very long project of my supervisor. She has been collecting these specimens for a very long time. And we did a phylogeny using this ITS and uh, chloroplast marker, one ITS and one chloroplast marker. And this is the combined phylogeny what we have uh, obtained. So here, I'll, I'll zoom into that. So this is all the, this portion is the North American phylogeny, which we are not interested in, it's well resolved. So the Indian uh, phylogeny, Indian, uh, or Indian or the Asian species is in this part. I'll zoom into that. So this is the uh, Asian spiranthus. So here you can see, you can see multiple plates here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, I mean, one, two, three, four, at least four clays are there. This is the European uh, spiranthus, the two ones I told, right? Uh, spiralis and uh, Estivalis. They are coming out as a separate lineage. So this is the Asian lineage. Under the Asian lineage, you have Nivea coming out, the Taiwan endemic I told, right? it is coming out as a separate species. And the white flowered Indian one I told from Kurg and multiple places, right? Uh, Manipur, it's spread across. And also we have collected some of these samples from China also, this white colored. They're all coming under one clay. And this is the new species, which has not been described. It was, it was called sinensis before. If it was sinensis, it should be sitting in, in this clay, right? It came out clearly as a separate clay. So we described it as a new species. And you can see sinensis uh, is, is a, it's a it's kind of a species complex, though it, they call it as a sinensis. Several clays are there. More sampling is required because it is present in a very wide geographical range. More sampling is required here. But as of now, we could call it as a uh, species complex because Australian people call it as Paranthus uh, australis. But uh, our Australian samples also, some of them are uh, the New Zealand sample and all are fitting in Paranthus uh, sinensis only. So this was published as a new species. 
And now a uh, little bit about hybrid speciation. So the initially the first slide I talked about uh, Spiranthus himalayensis. So this is a um, hybrid species which has been uh, researched by my lab in Hong Kong who was working on that. So they found it is an allotetraploid. So in speciation we have seen uh, different allopatry, sympatry, all these peripatry and all these, right? These are uh, speciation based on geographical separation. But there's another force of speciation, which is ploidy, which, which, is, uh, which is playing an important role, especially in plants. So whenever two species are there, they can hybridize and they can form a hybrid. And this hybrid is not strong because this hybrid can back cross because they have the same chromosome number because two is receiving one haploid number from the father and one haploid number from the mother. And the diploid hybrid is formed. But this diploid hybrid is, cannot be a uh, valid species because over a period of time they can like in uh, in uh, mendelian genetics you know the back cross right the hybrid is crossed with a parent parent again so finally all the genes will be diluted they will return to the parental any of any one of the parent so they are not a valid species but what happens if a genome duplication happens in the hybrid and that too these two are uh, coming from two different parents a genome dupli duplication happens and when they are forming gametes they can't back cross with the parent so allotetraploidy allo is an uh, important form of speciation. It can give rise to new species because of the uh, ploidy, because of the uh, chromosome number is increased. This is a very important uh, condition in several plants. So we wanted to know what is the paternal and maternal origin, uh, progenitors of these uh, Spiranthus hongkongensis. Uh, this hybrid, hybrid speciation should also occur in a region where both of these parental species are there, right? Some, somewhere they might have come across and this hybrid uh, speciation would have happened. So the initial idea was, uh, the scientists thought that spiral is the, the European one and the Asian one, they meet somewhere in the Himalayan region. So that's where this hybridization could have happened. So the, the range is overlap. We thought that must be the region where this hybridization could have happened initially. But we couldn't get the sample of spirals. My, my supervisor, she couldn't get the sample uh, before. And since we started collecting more and more samples, we wanted to find out this uh, paralogs of ITS uh, are present in the hybrid. What are the different paralogs present in the ITS? So for that, we cloned the ITS. So if within a hybrid individual, there'll be multiple copies of the ITS. Multiple sequences would be there. When you're doing a sequencing, you will get a messy sequence. You get messy peaks. That means two sequences are there, two templates are there for the sequencing reaction. So you will get some messy peaks. So obviously you can say some hybridization has happened. So to clarify that, we can clone it. That means one individual ITS will be in one plasmid clone. Another individual ITS region will be in another plasmid clone. So you have to sequence many of these plasmid clones and then find out. So when we build the phylogeny, some of these uh, ITS are, are nested within this red uh, clade here. So the red clade is the Himalayansis, the new species which you have discovered. So now we have discovered this new species, what we have, which came out through a molecular phylogeny, is the paternal progenitor of this uh, Spiranthus hongkongensis. So that is what we discovered. Later we found that uh, in a region in China, in Guangzhou province, we collected uh, samples uh, uh, labeled as uh, sinensis. But we found that it, it, it contains a mixture of both uh, Hong Kongensis and the Himalayansis also. Probably in that region, the hybridization could have happened somewhere in China. So that's about it. We did some molecular dating and uh, and also a little bit about uh, I'll end with the biogeography. So this uh, Spiranthus is an Asian clade, right? So uh, sorry, it's an American clade. So we wanted to know whether it came across the uh, Atlantic, came into Europe, and then it came into India, or it came the other other way around. So our uh, ancestral area reconstruction mentioned showed that uh, the ancestral area of the Asian Spiranthus is uh, North America. So it has not come through Europe. And whatever European species present today are, are, are moved from Asia into Europe, not, not, not the other way around. So this is some of the applications of molecular phylogenetics. So these are, so it's published in uh, MPE. So, I think uh, I'll have to one hour and a little bit more. Because of lack of time, I couldn't cover much in detail of many of the things which I wanted to talk. And this is my email. If you have any doubt, you can ask me or you can contact me also from, for some collaboration or some discussion, you can contact me. Any, any doubts?
Yes, barcodes for plants, is, especially from the Indian region, is very difficult because we have a huge diversity. A rapid evolution is happening. So, uh, barcoding.